Dorothy Jane Scott disappeared on 28 May 1980 in Anaheim, California, from a hospital where she had brought a colleague, Conrad Broston, to seek medical treatment for a spider bite. She noticed during a meeting that Conrad looked unwell and took him to the emergency room with Pam Head, another colleague. Little did Conrad and Pam know that the last time they would see Dorothy is when she left them to bring the car around to the hospital entrance. Hi everyone, today we'll be talking about the unsolved murder of Dorothy Jane Scott, who was most likely kidnapped and murdered by her stalker. This is also an unsolved mystery, as her killer continues to remain at large. If you are interested in dark and mysterious stories, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and turn on all notification buttons to stay updated on all of our latest videos. Let's get started. So who was Dorothy Scott? Dorothy was a single mom of a four-year-old son. The pair lived in California with Dorothy's aunt, where Dorothy worked as a secretary of two jointly owned Anaheim stores. A devout Christian, she did not drink or do drugs. Instead, she was a homebody who did not date much. Her simple life was disrupted a few months before her abduction and eventual death. She started receiving strange phone calls at work from an unidentified male caller whose voice sounded oddly familiar. The caller was by turns friendly though obsessive, and at other times violent and angry. He told her that he loved her and his plan to murder her. He also seemed to know her schedule well. The phone calls became even more frightening quickly, with the caller telling Dorothy that he would get her alone and cut her up into pieces so no one would ever find her. Another frightening phone call had the caller telling Dorothy to go outside because he had something for her. She went out and saw a single dead rose on the windscreen of her car. Fearing for her life, the peace-loving Dorothy started taking karate lessons and even contemplated buying a gun so that she could defend herself. She eventually decided against it as she was worried that her son may hurt himself, but the gun may have come in handy given what had happened to her after that. Dorothy attended an employee meeting on 28 May 1980 and she noticed that her colleague, Conrad, looked unwell and seemed to be in pain. She managed to convince him to get it checked out at the hospital and asked Pam to come with them. At the hospital, Dorothy sat with Pam the entire time while Conrad was being examined by the doctors. After Conrad received his treatment, Dorothy told the duo that she would bring the car around to the entrance. They waited a long time for her, but she did not appear. Finally, her car came into view, but with the lights on high beam, the car sped past them with no signs of stopping. Conrad and Pam assumed that Dorothy rushed off due to family emergency, but grew worried when they did not hear from her after a couple of hours. Dorothy's family and the police were called, and a search was launched. Several long hours later, Dorothy's car was found, 10 miles away, engulfed in flames. There was no sign of an accident, but there was also no sign of Dorothy. This ignited hope in Dorothy's family that she might be fine, but as time went by and she stayed missing, the family started to worry. Dorothy's parents were initially told by the police not to contact the media about her disappearance. However, a phone call about a week after her disappearance changed that. Dorothy's mother, Vera, received a call at her residence, and the male voice at the other end asked her if she was related to Dorothy Scott. When Vera said yes, the caller simply said the words that no mother wanted to hear. I've got her. Throwing caution to the wind, the family contacted the media in hopes that they would be able to figure out who the mysterious caller was, but that did not happen. They did get more information out of contacting the media though. The Orange County Register ran an article on Dorothy's disappearance, and on 12 June 1980, received a phone call from an unidentified male who said this about Dorothy. I killed her. I killed Dorothy Scott. She was my love. I caught her cheating with another man. She denied having someone else. I killed her. This unidentified caller also shared details about why Dorothy was at the hospital on the night of the abduction and the colour of the scarf that she was wearing. These details were not publicly shared, leading police to believe that the caller was responsible for Dorothy's death. The phone calls did not stop there. The man called almost every Wednesday afternoon for almost four years when Vera was alone at home. Sadly, the calls were too brief for the police to trace them. The calls only stopped in April 1984 when Dorothy's father, Jacob, answered the call instead of Vera. 
a construction worker discovered a strange set of bones in the construction site. The police were contacted and Dorothy's bones were discovered alongside those of a dog. A turquoise ring and a watch, both identified by Vera as belonging to her daughter, were also found. In a strange turn of events, the watch had stopped on 12.30am on 29th May 1980, the same day where Dorothy had gone missing. Did the watch stop at the time of her death? An autopsy was done to identify Dorothy's body, but no cause of death could be established. The mysterious caller seemed reinvigorated by the discovery of Dorothy's body, and called Vera's house a few more times. Police continued to be unable to trace the calls, and the likely murderer was never found. As is the usual in such cases, the police turned to investigate Dorothy's son's biological father. He, however, had an airtight alibi and was not investigated much further. One name that has been floated around is that of Michael Butler's. Described as an unstable individual, he was suspected to be involved in cult activities. Michael's sister also worked at the same shop where Dorothy did, and he would come into the shop from time to time. He was said to have become obsessed with Dorothy. Dorothy's son believes that this man is his mother's killer. There are some reasons why he believes this to be true. Michael would have had a good idea of Dorothy's schedule, since his sister works in the same shop as her. This also gives him a good excuse to hang around the shop area without arousing much suspicions. Michael had also spoken with Dorothy's father before. This could explain why the mysterious caller stopped calling at Dorothy's parents' home after Jacob picked up the phone. He could be afraid that Jacob would be able to recognise his voice. Despite this, there is really no hard evidence linking Michael Butler to the death of Dorothy Scott, and the crime remains unsolved till today. Vera and Jacob Scott had both passed on without knowing how or why their daughter died. Anyway guys, that's it for today. Drop a comment down below on what you think of this video. If you have other stories you wish for me to cover, leave a comment and a link for me to look deeper into it. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our latest videos. I'll see you in our next Campfire Stories. Thank you for watching.